hello everyone and welcome to our community Bible study. We're reading in Acts chapter 10 about a man named Cornelius. And uh, we're going through different characters. And let's begin by, by a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word and the stories of people of faith who've gone before us. Help us to learn and draw closer to you. Amen. Well, it's interesting. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. Now, as I understand it, a centurion is a soldier, uh, an officer who is over a hundred Roman soldiers. So he is over a hundred fierce fighting men. If you understand, the Roman Empire was strong and uh, many times brutal. And uh, the Roman army uh, took over, obviously, a good part of the nations around the Mediterranean Sea, both in Europe, uh, Middle East, and North Africa. And in many of them, they just came in and took over and ran the whole countries. In Israel, uh, somebody realized they had some strong leaders there. So they were occupying the nation and allowing um, the kings in the, uh, in the area of what is now Syria, Lebanon, Israel, to continue to rule, but under their authority. A Roman centurion, as I picture it, is a strong man who knows authority because he is over uh, other men, and, uh, and they, are, they are fierce. So he was in the Italian regiment. So this is a group that came all the way from Italy. They weren't people they picked up along the way or somewhere else. These are soldiers from Italy, probably very experienced in my opinion. Um, the interesting thing was this centurion is described as being devout and God-fearing. We don't know if he had actually converted to Judaism whether he was born Jewish or whether he uh, was just following the, um, the guidance of uh, the law of Moses and the, uh, all the rules that follow from that. And so he was operating and acting at least as a very good Jewish person. So Cornelius, uh, we'll read in a minute about uh, his generosity, his regular prayer. He lived in Caesarea, which if you take a good look at the word, it's, it was named after Caesar. It was a city that was created. And I don't know all of how it looks today, because I know they've restored more of the Roman um, ruins that were there. And ruins is really not the right word, because when I was there in 1981, you could see the Roman aqueduct that was still going along the beach. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you could look, and they had created a bit of a port so ships could come in and out uh, because there aren't a lot of natural harbors on that part of the Mediterranean. You also, um, uh, what was the other? Oh, there was quite a well-restored amphitheater then. I think the amphitheater had quite a bit of work done on it, but that aqueduct looked like uh, with a few little uh, you know, mortar work around where the water was supposed to flow, the structure was sound oh, yeah. in 1981. It was built 2,000 <laughs> years ago. So Caesarea is right there on the coast, and this is where Cornelius is. So we'll begin chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. They had moved there with him. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. Now let me pause because can you imagine the fierce commander of a hundred of Rome's best soldiers being afraid? Yeah. The experience of the angel of God speaking to him 
created fear even in a man <laughs> named Cornelius. Yes. And I have a funny feeling that what is it, Lord, was perhaps stated bravely but felt timidly. <laughs> <laughs> My opinion. The angel answered him, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him and gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants people he trusted. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. The second person in our story is Simon Peter. And you remember, he was a fisherman. He and his brother Andrew were fishing in Galilee when Jesus chose him to lead the early church. Um, remember the first Christians were Jewish. They were all Jews. They, Jesus, Peter, and the apostles, they follow the Jewish law and practices. And they weren't particularly a distinct group of people. They were a specific group within the Jewish faith. Hmm. And what we're reading about today is a little bit of a transition in that, in that relationship. And one of the questions that I that the church is going to have to deal with was how do you handle newcomers who are not Jewish? Will they have to convert? Mm -hmm. Will they have to be circumcised? Will they have to do all of these things in order to be part of the church? And they struggle with that. So here is what happened. Cornelius is in Caesarea. Peter is in Joppa. And he has this experience. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey, those soldiers from Cornelius and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. Houses had flat roofs. That's where you got cool, sleep at night, you were safe. So he went up there to pray because that was a private area. Peter became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was, meal was being prepared down below somewhere, Peter fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Have you ever looked at a package and seen a little circle with a K on the package of food that you might buy? That stands for the fact that that package is deemed kosher. Uh, there's another word that's used for that, and I admit I've forgotten it, but that means that it is at the factory that has been cleared, the practices of that factory for food preparation has been cleared by a rabbi who declares it kosher. The laws in especially Leviticus, the Levitical laws about food are very strict. And um, I am not very good at remembering all of them, but certain kinds of footed animals are kosher and some are not. Um, reptiles are not kosher. Um, fish are kosher if they breathe through gills. So shrimp and lobster and crustaceans and things like that and shellfish are not. Um, you don't mix meat and milk. There are a number of things, and they, they, it's, it's pretty extensive. So when Peter has this vision of all these animals together in the sheet and God telling him to eat, 
uh, they weren't all kosher. Mm -hmm. And Peter was not willing to do that. Peter said, I've never done that. Peter, although he wasn't highly educated, he was very observant. And um, he had never eaten anything that was not, quote, kosher, uh, that, was, that was unclean. Or if it were meat or something that wasn't prepared well where the blood was drained, a lot of details. So this happened three times. Verse 17, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. They knocked at the door. <laughs> <laughs> While Peter was still thinking about the vision. So he was still puzzled about this. So we have the vision. First it said Peter was wondering about it. And then on verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about this vision, see, this really um, uh, got him unsettled. He wasn't sure what it meant. The spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Uh, go get up, excuse me, and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Page three on our study guide. I include a little map. Mm -hmm. Um, Caesarea is 24 miles from Joppa. They're both on the coast. Joppa, if I am correct, was is the one place on the coast where there's a real natural uh, port kind of area, and Caesarea was a human made a human made one. So here we go. Um, Peter went down from the roof of the home and said to the men, "I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come?" The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men inside to be his guests there at that house in Joppa. So the next day, Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. They moved pretty good in one day for 24 miles walking. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So there was a pretty good crowd there. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. The Roman centurion had humbled himself before Peter. Wow. Verse 27. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. <laughs> he said to them, you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Yeah. See, he got that lesson yeah. from the vision. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Well, Cornelius tells him the other side of the story. Three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has remembered, has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Wow, Peter had another captive audience. Oh, yes. You know, this is not the first example. It's, it's one of several examples. You know, this is only a, within a few months after Jesus' crucifixion, and already God has provided Peter and the, and the apostles with crowds of people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, crowds of people in the temple courtyard area when, when a man was healed, 
Um, lots of opportunities. And here is a new one with people gathered around saying, we'll listen to whatever the Lord commands you to tell us. Yes, expecting. Verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. I now, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Now, I'm going to pause because I think that's an important sentence. It reminds Peter and those there and us today that God doesn't show favoritism meaning God accepts people from every nation. Um, no matter which continent, no matter which nation, no matter what race, no matter what gender, no matter um, the color of one's skin or the language that one speaks, um, Peter realized that God does not show favoritism. And so um, if we fear the Lord and do what is right, then we are all about the same thing. Verse 36, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened, everyone had heard, what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So Peter's reminding them that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies about the Messiah. While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God, just like Peter and the apostles at Pentecost. Yeah. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Well, this was a step beyond. Oh, yes for the early church. Um, first Peter, who was the authority of the early church um, and was respected and to whom people were turning more and more as the church grew, this good Jewish fisherman understood that God wanted them to reach out to, to other people. And so he not only went to speak to Cornelius, but went into his home and met with uh, the Gentiles, whoever was gathered there. And that is a step of the church moving beyond being just Jewish to also include those who were not if they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we know the church continues to grow and we today are, are a legacy of some of that. But I think it's good to remember a couple of things. Number one, the faith of a man named Cornelius, who was an, perhaps an unlikely follower, but became a follower, um, and a good man. And people appreciated that. Simon Peter, who, because he listened to the Lord, 
learn that his ideas were not the God's final ideas about who could become part of the church. And then the reminder of, uh, what did, how did Peter put this? Again, God does not show favoritism to any group of people, but he accepts from every nation those who fear him and do what is right. May you and I live up to that standard. May we enjoy our lives and may God's spirit lead us um, in whatever way he chooses. God bless you. Have a great week.